Welcome to the Education and Empowerment Podcast. In this show, our hosts explore success and advancement through education by interviewing today's top leaders in the fields of education, business, and technology in order to provide insight into what it really takes to succeed. This show is brought to you by Forstay, a SaaS-enabled online booking marketplace for student and intern housing. Forstay provides turnkey, all-in-one, cloud-based accommodation software solutions for colleges, universities, and organizations. Learn more at offcampus.forstay.com and landlords.forstay.com. All right, let's get into the show. Hello and welcome to the Education and Empowerment Podcast. This is Marcia de Soy, I'm your host for the show. And today I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. George Box. In this podcast, Dr. Box will discuss the importance of research and student success outside of classroom. Welcome to our podcast, Dr. Box. Thank you, Bakhtiar. Happy to be with you. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I'm honored to be speaking with you. And for starters, I'd like to get to know you a little bit better and our audience would like to know you a little better. So, you know, would you give us a little bit more about how you actually ended up in higher education and what you do today? Well, thank you. I guess that's a good place to start. My interest in education actually goes way back. One day when I was in high school chemistry class, my teacher came to see me to tell me that the fourth grade teacher wanted somebody to teach a a science module to her students because she was unfamiliar with science. So I said, sure, I'll give it a try. Well, I fell in love with teaching. These four fourth grade kids were sitting on the edge of their seats and taking litmus paper home and (laughs) coming back and telling me what they found. So I really fell in love with education early on. And then I'm a first generation college student myself, first in my family to go to college. Awesome. And uh, at Ohio State, I had the chance to be a teaching assistant uh, as an undergraduate. And uh, again, I uh, fell in love with teaching because I was able to explain concepts to students that were a little, maybe it may have been a little confused by the lecture. So it, it was re- really rewarding to me to be able to help these students. And then, of course, as a graduate student at University of California at Santa Barbara, I had the same, same opportunity to be a, a teaching assistant and later became a professor in a community college, and then a chance to be a middle-level administrator, and then a chance to be a college president and a national association president. So I really have seen education transform lives and improve communities. So it's just been a re- really rewarding career for me. That's, that's, you know, really inspiring. And, you know, when I was reading about you and LinkedIn and, you know, other sources, I was like, these people exist. <laughs> I want to know them. Um, and I also want to give a chance to our podcast listeners to, you know, get to know you better. You mentioned something very interesting about, you know, your experience and how you were able to explain the different concepts. I think the concept that we are trying to find out a little bit more is what is student success outside of classroom? I mean, obviously there's so much right now with the pandemic and, you know, all the discussions about, you know, how students should be successful in classroom. But I think what most of people want to hear now is, you know, what is out there for, you know, student uh, success outside of classroom uh, programming. And I was hoping that uh, you could share, you know, your understanding of, you know, what does um, student success mean to you as, a, as an expert in the field? Well, I think uh, a good place to start is what does student success mean? I think at its most basic level, it means le- learning. It means learning new skills and concepts and new ways of thinking. On a more practical level, it probably means being able to accomplish your goals, being able to complete uh, your objectives, what you start out for, whether it be getting a degree or a certificate. And then of course, after graduation, success means carrying that learning into into a career or maybe into other life, life aspects of life. So I think basically that's what success means. And, And I really think a lot of learning occurs outside of the classroom. Students need, of course, to be prepared for their classes. They need to spend some time studying before they get into class and then uh, reviewing their notes as soon as they can after class and doing research. Uh, could be library research or field research and reading and, of course, homework. But students uh, also benefit a great deal from interacting with each other. 
in study groups and discussion groups. I remember my own days as a student at Ohio State, I learned a great deal discussing issues with, with my colleague students in, in my dormitory. So those things are very important. There's also been a lot of research that uh, shows that students are more successful if they are engaged in student organizations and clubs, uh, honor societies, and student government. So all of those aspects of engagement are important for student success. That's great. That's great. I mean, that's certainly, you know, what we're learning these days from our other podcasters, as well as, you know, the experts in the field. But you mentioned, you know, a couple element and the element, I guess, you know, we are as at four stay engaged in is the, you know, residential life and also the, the off campus, you know, part of things. And, you know, when you look at the work that's being done right now, and for the past, you know, 10, 15 years, I mean, you mentioned that you've seen institutions transform, what challenges have you noticed being present and how are those challenges, you know, being proactively taken to be resolved? Well, of course, we're living right now in one of the most challenging times uh, for higher education that, that we've had in my lifetime. And that's, that's been caused by the pandemic, which has caused a lot of isolation. It's made it difficult for students to interact with each other and with their faculty members. For a lot of our students, technology has been an issue. They have not necessarily had the, the right kind of equipment. They may not have been able to afford it, or they, they may not have had an internet connection. There's also been some recent research that shows that a lot of students in the United States are economically disadvantaged, and they are food insecure and housing insecure. They may not know where they're going to be living in, in the next few weeks or where they're going to get their next meal. So, so those are significant challenges. We also have persistent achievement gaps in the United States. Generally, a lot of our low-income students or our students of color are not as successful as they should be in, in our higher education system. And then those concerns that, that we have for the students, the colleges and universities themselves are struggling right now because the pa pandemic has caused uh, losses, which has affected their budgets. So we're living at a very challenging time right now. And of course, we're, it looks like we're beginning to get out of this pandemic, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Are the students going to be able to come back? Will they come back? Will the universities and colleges be able to survive this difficult budget time? So some un unanswered questions right now. It's interesting you say that. And in fact, you know, what we're trying to find out through obviously this podcast and in our numerous conversations is you know, what's the way future look like, right? And what can we do now, given the, the situation? I mean, obviously, there is a, you know, a passive approach, which is let's just, uh, you know, have things happen, uh, or there's a very proactive approach, which, which involves kind of taking a step back and, and reflecting on, you know, what, what, what's out there, right? What this theory says, and what, you know, what, what research is available there. And I'm glad to be talking to you today to discover all the elements of research and on what research is important or not, and how educators can actually use research to form and to engage and to promote support networks for students to make them successful. So if you'd like to, you know, give our audience, you know, an insight into importance about that, that would be great. Sure. I think it's becoming more and more important, especially as we we shift from a focus only on providing access to higher ed to actually trying to help our students to be successful and and to enhance their learning while they're while they're enrolled in our colleges and universities. So I want to mention a few a few examples of research studies that I think have significant significant information for for educators and for students alike. And the first one I'll mention was a, a little experiment that was done by Eric Mazur, who's a professor of physics at Harvard. He teaches in a big lecture hall. And he was uh, concerned that his students were not as successful as they should be. They're just passively sitting in the lecture hall. So he decided to try to get them more engaged. And what he did was he would write a problem on the board and then he would say, okay, turn to your neighbor and, and talk about this problem for a couple of minutes. And there was a big commotion in the classroom while the students were talking with each other about the problem. And then he called them back together and they solved the problem. He found by doing that, it engaged the students. They weren't just passively sitting there anymore. They were actually helping each other, communicating and focusing on the problem. 
And he found that helped the students to learn and they became much more successful in his physics classes. So, so student engagement is important and that's just one experiment uh, that showed that. Another one I'll mention is, was done by Uri Treisman when he was a professor of calculus at, at University of California at Berkeley. He often wondered, why is it that my Asian students are always the top students? They get the best grades. And my African-American students mostly never make it through the course. So he took some time and studied the behavior of these students. And he found out the Asian students formed study groups and they helped each other with the homework and taught each other how to solve the problems. Whereas the black students and the white students were more competitive and didn't study together. So he decided to experiment and he formed a study group of black students. And guess what? They became successful in his calculus class. So there's another important message for students and for, for faculty members. Uh, students, if you can get yourself into a study group, you're going to learn better and you're going to be more successful. And faculty, if you can help your students to form these study groups, it will help to get them through your classes. Another one I'll mention was done by Phi Theta Kappa, which is the International Honor Society for Community College Students in combination with the Center for Community College Student Engagement. They did an experiment on focused on, on male students of color. We have a problem in the United States in that male students of color are very successful in, in colleges and universities. So there were a number of them, though, that were honor society students. So this study was done by interviewing the Black uh, students, Black male students who were honor society students. And they and they, were, they thought they would find out that these students were perhaps had different backgrounds than the students of color who didn't make it. But guess what? They had the same exact backgrounds. They both, that both successful and unsuccessful male students of color came from poor economic backgrounds, single parent backgrounds, crime ridden communities. What made the difference was that someone cared about them. Someone reached out to them and checked in to see how they were doing. And the other thing is that they formed a, a network, a social network with other students who were like them, who cared about learning. And they cut their ties with the other people in the community that would have dragged them down. So a couple of important messages here for, for students, find a mentor, <laughs> uh, find right. someone who cares about you. And, and actually you could be a mentor too, uh, and you could be a tutor. And actually, if you are a tutor, you're probably going to learn better because nothing uh, helps you to learn faster than being a teacher. And the second thing is form ties with students who are like you, who care about learning and want to be successful. So that's another important one. Actually, the students who are Phi Theta Kappa members, Honor Society members, com complete at a much higher rate than students who aren't, even, even if the students get the same grade point average. So it just shows you the network effect of students affiliating with other students who also want to be successful. There's also a lot of a lot of research data about learning communities. These are clusters of classes that students take together with 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 a cohort of teachers. And the students, because they're taking the same classes, same they're taking classes uh, with the same students over and over, they get to know know other students and they form bonds and help each other. And there actually are some natural kinds of learning communities like nursing and allied health and also athletic programs where students are able to get to know each other really well and they tend to help each other. So those are some examples of research that shows a dramatic impact on uh, student success and student learning. That's great. That's great. And how do you see these being implemented in practice? Do you think the pandemic um, and all the you know challenges that you mentioned earlier will become obstacles for successfully implementing and using that research in day-to-day -day programming, or do you not see that as a problem? Well, in some respects, it's a problem, but pandemic itself has forced change. And in fact, it was very rapid change. The colleges and universities had to turn on a dime, so to speak, because they, they were closed in about a year ago in March. And so they had to go completely online and video conference, and they had to do it very quickly. So, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna see, I, we're gonna see a lot of this continuing. We're gonna see an increased number of online classes and classes by video conference and student services by video conference tutoring. We're seeing some companies um, being developed now that provide online when students need it. <laughs> 
when they have a question about somebody doing their homework, they can get online and tutor right away. So we're, we're seeing a lot of innovation caused by the, the disruption of the pandemic. You know, Winston Churchill is quoted as saying, um, never waste a good crisis. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are in a crisis that, that was this pandemic, and uh, it has forced a lot of change. And I, and I think it's going to, going to, even when things go back to sort of normal, we're not going to return to exactly the same way we were before. And colleges are still going to be focused on trying to help their students, but I think they're going to have some new ways to do it. Awesome. Awesome. You touched on a very important aspect of our conversations, which is innovation and, and transformation. Would you be so kind to perhaps you know, share your opinion about what type of innovation will be important moving forward? And what do you see being the, the most, the biggest area of, of opportunity right now that you know, educators or operators in higher education or you know, senior management can take advantage of? I think in terms of opportunity, we're, we're seeing a, a greater emphasis on student success and right. not just access. Back when I was going to college as a student, the whole issue was access. The, the university gave me an opportunity, but it was up to me to be successful or not. And they made that pretty clear. <laughs> now, now universities and colleges are more focused on helping their students to be successful. And state policymakers are are also pushing the colleges and accrediting agencies are pushing the colleges. And in fact, a lot of states are changing funding formulas and, and linking the funding of the colleges and universities to how successful they are in getting students through to completion. So I think we're gonna see a continued um, focus on the institutions to help our, help our students. We're also, I think, gonna see an increased focus on uh, use of data and the research, like the research studies that I mentioned. So I think we're going to see administrators and other educators in their committee meetings when they're making decisions, asking questions about how is this going to help our students to be more successful? How is it going to help our students to learn? And then how are we going to know whether this really does help our students to be successful? So I think there's going to be a much greater focus on, on student success at the institutional level. Uh, I think it will, it will uh, spur some more innovation and uh, people are going to try things to help students to be successful. That's great. That's great. And I was looking at research the other day, you know, saying that outsourcing is becoming a big hit right now in a survey out of like 2,500 leaders uh, like yourself, they got a confirmation that um, over 83% of them actually confirmed that they are outsourcing. They you know, student services or housing or, you know, any type of work that's kind of not the, the main focus of, of the higher education institution. What do you think about that? Is it a good way to go? Yes, I think so. And in fact, I just had a conversation a few weeks ago with Bryce Harris, who is the former chancellor of the California Community Colleges. And uh, he was telling me the, the same thing, that this was his opinion, that colleges need to focus on their core mission, which is teaching and learning, you know, helping the students to be successful and ancillary kinds of things. And he even talked about things like childcare, but we, we talked about the students who are suffering from food insecurity and housing security. He didn't think the colleges should be themselves establishing housing or, or food pantries or childcare facilities. He thought the colleges should be partnering with other organizations and community organizations to provide those services that were not necessarily directly related to the mission of those institutions. So um, I'm all in favor of partnering because we have such limited resources in higher education. We need to focus those on, on our true mission and leverage uh, resources by partnering with other, other organizations that support our mission. That's great. That's great. That's exactly what we do actually at Four State. You know, I've been having a lot of good conversations with, you know, executives and VPs and people who are in enrollment, international student services, you know, people who are directly involved in housing. And, and there is a lot of innovation, so to speak, happening right now as, you know, things are moving towards 
learning happens everywhere mode because you know now people are realizing that oh you know i can i can be home and actually be studying so i think from that standpoint there's going to be a big demand for off-campus housing and and i see a lot of partnerships happening so i'm glad you mentioned that this is certainly great and and the research that you mentioned i have a quick question about the work that you do now i mean you're actually teaching you know doctoral students at, a, at an institution that i have so much respect for it's the San Diego State you know University what do you teach there and you know what are you getting from the future experts in higher education are they in good hands these days well I'm, I'm very fortunate to be involved in preparing our next generation of college and university leaders so I teach in the doctoral program at San Diego State University and also in the doctoral program at Kansas State University and my students are usually faculty members, mid-level faculty members, or mid-level administrators who want to become more, maybe college presidents, more responsible administrators, or maybe, maybe even chancellors. So we teach, classes I teach are in history of uh, higher ed and community colleges and, and emerging issues. So we, we study issues right, right out of the newspapers and have debates about topics. So it's a very engaging kind of class and it's my way of contributing even after I've retired from being a college president and, and being a, a president of a, a national association, I'm still able to contribute by helping these uh, students to uh, accomplish their goals. That's great. That's great. And, you know, as we kind of wrap up, you know, on, on this episode, what piece of wisdom would you like to leave with our podcast listeners about student success or about being successful in general? Well, I think for students, my message is to be, to be engaged in their learning. That means to be prepared for class and to review your notes as quickly as you can after class form study groups or participate in study groups with other students, find a mentor, mentor others, and don't fall behind in your studies. For uh, educators, find ways to engage the students like Eric Mazur did at Harvard. In spite of having a huge lecture hall, he was able to engage his students. Provide uh, timely and meaningful feedback to students. Uh, don't take forever to grade those papers. And when you grade them, put comments um, and if the students have a have done a good job, you know, put that comment on the paper and make decisions that are data informed. Don't just follow your gut, but look at the data and the research. And as I mentioned before, always ask uh, when you're making decisions about students and in your institution, always ask, how is this decision going to affect my students and their success and their learning? And secondly, how are we going to know how this decision has affected student success and student learning? That's amazing. That's very inspiring. Uh, what would be the best way to find you if uh, people want to follow you or connect with you? Well, unfortunately, I don't have Twitter, <laughs> but but I am on uh, LinkedIn and, and you can email me. My email is gbogs at palomar.edu. That's P-A-L-O-M-A-R dot E-D-U. That's great. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been uh, very inspiring. I appreciate your time uh, on behalf of Four State Team and the Education and Empowerment Podcast. Uh, please accept um, our appreciation for the podcast listeners. Uh, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on podcast.forstate.com so you never miss an episode. And Dr. Box, once again, thank you so much. If anyone is curious about what Four State does and the services we provide to colleges and universities, check us out at podcast.forstate.com. And until our next podcast, stay tuned. Thanks, Dr. Jair. Thanks for what you're doing. Thank you so much for your time. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Education and Empowerment Podcast. This show is brought to you by Forstay, a SaaS-enabled online booking marketplace for student and intern housing. Forstay provides turnkey, all-in-one, cloud-based accommodation software solutions for colleges, universities, and organizations. Learn more at offcampus.forstay.com and landlords.forstay.com.